Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Bold and Bodacious Sisterhood. I am your creator and host, Gabrielle Garofalo. I am a life coach. I'm an entrepreneur. I'm a solopreneur. And I created the series as um, my own education and sort of deeper commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I want to shine a light on all of my sisters of color and my black sisters and my indigenous sisters. So today I am thrilled to welcome my guest, Monique Elias, who has an incredible brand, Home Sweet Home People, which I can't wait for you to check out. And I'm going to ask Monique to tell us where we can find your stuff. But first, Monique, Tell us how you got to become an artist. Like what, how did you know to follow your passion no matter what the world told you about being an artist as a living? How did you know that? Well, my degrees, my BA is in Russian from the University of Chicago. And it was like my last year and he was my best friend in college. You know, he, you know, he got me into like, um, we, we, we- Was this a classmate of yours? Um, actually, yes, he was a classmate of mine, um, and he got me into drawing, and then I was drawing stick figures at the time, he's like, well, why don't you apply to Parsons? I'm like, well, I can, you know, read, write, and speak Russian and French fluently, but I can't, I, all I can do is stick figures. So oh my I, gosh. You, so, so, I, you're, so you're trilingual. I used to be. I haven't, the French I still speak with my godparents. Okay. Uh, I, for Dr. Monique Verley, um, and uh, the Russian is pretty much, every now and then I have dreams in fluent Russian, because it, it's been like 30 years. If you don't use it, you lose it. Yeah, da, I should say, right? Exactly. But some <laughs> dreams in complete fluent Russian, so it's back there somewhere. That's so cool. So, so you were introduced to this idea of drawing. Do you have any of your art near you, by the way? I should have told you, dang. Oh, art. I mean, my, uh, oh, God, let's see. It's all over the apartment. Um, uh, I'm so obsessed anyway, with her art. So I just, I should have prepared her, but let's have a walking tour with the artist. Let's see. Uh, I'm trying to see the, ah, uh, uh, here. Uh. My, that's one of them, or several of them. I have like at least 50,000 sketchbooks. Oh my so gosh. I, okay. I don't want to make you nuts and I shouldn't have put you on the spot, but I do love that we're getting, oh my God. And what's the website? I should have had it handy. The website oh, that you sent me to with the mugs and the t-shirts. Oh, www.homesweethomepeople.com. Oh, okay. So www.homesweethomepeople.com and you can go check out all Monique's designs and she does them on mugs and shirts and I'm sure of many other a thing. All yeah, right, those, go ahead. Go. I don't want you to like have to tour your whole house. So go get comfy again. That, that, sorry. That, that, but thank you. That, I love the spontaneous. That, I felt like you're like the docent in a museum of art. People have asked me if I would. I those are on the mugs and sketches. Those are just my, my. I that those are. So I applied to Parsons for fashion design. And I, I was doing well there until I had a head injury, which resulted into a coma, which cost me two years of memory. So I woke up in New York. I thought it was 1991, June 6th. I found out it was May, March, something, 1993. Can you imagine? I returned. People? Seriously, pause. That's a miracle. Monique is a miracle right now. Oh, I, I thought I had busted NYU law, and they said, you know, no. Um, uh, you apparently are at Parsons. I'm like, what the hell's a Parsons? Tell me it's a top 10 B school, law school, med school. They're like, it's an art school. I started crying immediately. Oh, because you thought you were in law school or something? Right. You told me this. I remember it when we first talked and I was like, what? That was what I was crying about. And, you know, the woman was like, you know, oh dear, you know, um, uh, uh, she she thought I was crying about my memory. I was like, screw my memory. I did that badly on my GSATs, my LSATs, and my MCATs. Law school, I mean, art school was my only alternative. I'm going to be poor. I can't draw anything. 
later on that day, because apparently I'd been conscious for about a couple of days, my parents, my mom came in and, or, and my dad was still in Chicago, but my mom came in and I was like, art school? Yeah, what the, you know, um, and she's like, well, this is what you said you wanted to do with your life. So your dad and I said, okay, you know. Really um, interesting. So I went back and forth to Parsons several times and I noticed that there were that, that I, the brain damage was real because I couldn't remember anything. I, you spend half your, your, your a week studying for something, then you take the exam and you've gone blank. So uh. I went back to Chicago, I saw a specialist and they said, look, you died on the table three times before they got you to comatose state. You were supposed to be, they told my parents to unplug me because 23 was a long time to, find, to live out a, as a vegetable in a nursing home affair. But my, they, they did. So this, so this all happened in 1991? 93. 93, okay. Wow. I've been living in India in 91 before going to Parsons in 91. I almost died of malaria there. But that's a whole different Jeez, thing. Monique. So all this time, you know, I've done. Yeah, I mean, there's malaria. I almost died of pneumonia, car accidents. I mean, I, I, you name it, I've gone through it, except for drug addiction and child labor. <laughs> but, so here's so, the here's the uh, word I have for Monique, which is survivor. Hardcore yeah, survivor. Yeah, I guess that's. And and you know, can I just stop so you for a sec? Because what I notice about your art is that it really is so joyous. Yeah, and because- Even the name I, of the company you decided to create, Home Sweet Home oh, Depot. That's much later. Um, the but still. It's joyous because when I returned back to Chicago and you know I was 23, I was nervous about what was I gonna do with the rest of my life. I, I went into depression. So then I started deciding how I was gonna live out my life by writing. And I wrote about, um, um, Macron, no, Ramsey's, Ramsey's Jackson Cabot. And then I worked on all my issues there. And then I said, well, it's time to draw her. And so that's what you see is her. Wow. And then the next was I convinced my parents to let me start a clothing company. And um, it was, um, at first it was Macron and I, it was in Chicago. And I went back to India, got some clothing made, tried to sell it. It was a bummer because it was the wrong neighborhood. So then I moved to another neighborhood in Chicago, opened up a new boutique called the Yvette and decided to put, you know, design a little, but buy from other people. Mm -hmm. That was 10 or 11 years. And then I moved to New York and I'd been looking for a job, I had a little bit of success here and there. And the design, you know, I quit the design clothing for a while. No, it's always been there. It's still a passion. But then I thought, you know, what would Ramsey's be doing if I, I, I remember the chapter in Ramsey's life where she was writing books. So I wrote a couple of books that I've yet to publish, but I, well, after wait, I stop, slow down, slow down. All right, hold on, slow down. Cause you have like, there's so much there and I want the people who are going to be watching us um, to be able to sort of take it in. Cause I'm like, holy crap. I feel like I've lived 400 lives already. So what were your books about? What inspired that form of expression for you? Well, I'd always love to write. I mean, I have like, I still have the 700 pages of Ramsey's life in my, in my, in my, um, in my, in my apartment somewhere, you know, and then I, when I started to draw, I was thinking it brought up the childhood, the child in me. So. Mm -hmm. No, I love that. Let people hear that. So drawing. So, cause this is something as a life coach that I work with women on all the time. Like, what do you, like, to use like a pun, but like, what are you drawn to? What makes you feel alive or childlike or playful? I love that you said it made you, it like, oh, that's so beautiful. My childhood, you know, and I, I we, my parents, they were very, I, that's the reason why I don't have kids because my parents, I, I can't stop being their child even if I am 51. Um, even my sister, the same way. I mean, she's getting married and she'll be 50. And for the first time. Wow. We good, for her. You know, good for her. Good for you, by the way. Like, all to say, right? Everybody has their own path. Well, you know, I went to a small private school growing up when we take family vacations and there was, you know, we went to church together growing up. And yeah, it was so kind of like, it was very kind of, it was very, you know, like Midwestern, idyllic American childhood. You know, where did you um, grow up? Oh, uh, Chicago. Okay. 
Shy town. So, and I remembered, you know, the, the French class when I was a kid. And our French teacher, it was the 70s, would come in with the bun. Bonjour, class. Bonjour, madame. Comment allez-vous? Très bien, merci à vous. And the books that she would read to us. And there was this one book. I still have it. Oh, because my mom did the ballet when we were kids. Tales of the Ballet. Ah, oh, I love it. And it had famous ballets in, you know, in it. Wow. And the illustration, when I was drawn. Hold on one second. We're frozen. My laptop, I didn't know how to use it, but I met this kid and literally he was a, he was a kid because I had 20 years on him. He taught me Illustrator. So then I started, you know, I, I mean, Photoshop. So then I started, you know, doing all these prints that, you know, I from or prints that were kind of inspired by this book. Then I went on to learn Illustrator. And so now I do a lot more prints and with that came the home sweet home people you know head scarves and and home and home stuff mm -hmm. that's amazing that's amazing that's what, what I in, how i got there <laughs> that's amazing so as a kid did you grow up in in like a mixed environment with other were you predominantly in a white environment like what was your childhood uh, like there were about 40 kids in my high school class, and these were the 40 kids I'd been stuck with since, like, um, <laughs> stuck since with. and they're, they were pretty much all first generation, Greek, Jewish, Italian, Serbian, Lithuanian. It was very ironic for the 70s. Morgan Park Military Academy was a military school for boys in the 1800s. Sometime in the 1930s or 20s, they went co-ed. And so, you know, um, and ours was a pretty large class for 40 kids. Usually, you know, um, I was used to, that college was such a shock at UFC because I was used to like no more than like, you know, um, maybe no more than like 20 kids in a classroom you know, all my life. And then you get somewhere, you have a lecture hall. You're like, oh my God. Right. I mean, even Culture in, shock. Yeah, even in the entire, the entire school where it's like 450 kids at MPA. And, you know, the, we had a, a, everything was military kind of style, even lunch. You know, lower school kids sat in the lower school section, and you always had the head of the table was a teacher. Once you got to middle school, you had your, you didn't need a head of the table, and food was served country style. You know, you take a dish, you pass it yeah. down, and the person at the end of the table, or once you ran out of food, you went back to the kitchen, and they, you know, put it to you in the dish, and you bring it back. Yeah. And then in the middle of, at the end of lunch, the headmaster, one bell would ring. The headmaster would get up and do the announcements for the day. And then, you know, second bell meant, you know, recess. And then you hear a third bell from the main, one of the main schools on campus. And then that meant you were to be in your seat. You were to go to class and be right. in your seat. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So it's so fascinating. It's even like more fascinating to me now that you ultimately gravitated Canada to see, you know, around this time, yeah, this is a time of year for the Stratford for the uh, Shakespeare plays, because we did a lot of Shakespeare. We went to Mexico to see the te Aztec temples. I mean, yeah. like, whose childhood is this? I mean, that's amazing. It's amazing. We and I. And they, okay, we, every, we have been studying for a while, like Aztec temples. And one year uh, we asked, if, or the teacher's like, well, yeah, I think we all kind of conceded. Maybe we should go to Mexico on spring break and see the temples. And so we did. That's amazing. Okay, so when, you know, it's a really interesting time in America, obviously. There is a lot going on around the election, around race. And, um, and I like to say to people, like, you know, I grew up feeling like I was, and I know this is, now I know this is totally offensive, colorblind, which is why I'm going to use my air quotes, um, and felt like really, really woke until I decided to do this series. And then I realized I was actually just faux woke. Like it was all just a facade. <laughs> it was all a lie, people. This very intelligent, well-traveled, well-read white woman does not have a clue. So what do you want to know? What do, first of all, young black women, right, who are 10, 12, 13, 14 years old and may not be able to be exposed to the things that you've been exposed to, what do you want them to know about choosing a life of like 
passion, whether it's art or law or whatever. And what do you want them to know about what it means to be a black woman sort of right now in this moment in time? Well, I want, I would like for them to know, you know, to always be and to try and stay as informed as possible. You know, if you have access to a computer, also try and make friends of different cultures. I mean, for me, it wasn't, I mean, it was a given. I mean, you, or for anyone at MPA, it was a given. I mean, you know, people would say, well, I'm, I mean, I'm the only one, like, what do you mean? I'm the only Serb, I'm the only Jew, I'm the only Lithuanian, I'm the only Greek. Yeah, you know? it was a melting pot of ones. Yeah, you know, there, and, and on top of that, I really didn't know, I was even full woke because I really didn't even know how poorly Blacks were doing in America because every, every, every Black person I knew, you know, their parents were doctors, lawyers, architects, our, 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 all of our doctors were Black growing up as a kid. My parents, um, you know, were teachers. My dad was a, a, a businessman. Even Ironically, the, the racist kids, term white collar. So that's some bullshit right there, right? That's uh, that just, I just realized that white collar. Why are we calling it white collar? Our accountant was black, so yeah, you know, all the professionals. Yeah, and the one when we did get woke was when the one year every year we went to summer school was always at MPA. Well, one year all of the black mothers of the friends, all of my black friends that I had decided we were going to do not St. Ignatius, not NPA. We were going to do some pub, inner city public school for summer school. Oh my God. That was trauma, trauma, <laughs> trauma, trauma. I, was, I hate to say it kind of stereotypical. We were like, what the hell? What happened to law and order in the class? You were just supposed to be sitting there waiting for the teacher and collect information, wait for the bell and leave. Not breaking out and all. And then there were more than like 20 kids in the classroom. My sister and I ran around in our underwear the next morning and we refused to go back. We're like, we will do summer school, but we're not doing that hell. Wow. Not okay, let me ask you sort of a poignant question about that all of my black friends and we were like the next day we were all at the, the within the next couple of days we were all back at M morgan park military academy like yeah good to see you we stood our ground yeah i mean let me ask you about that because that's really interesting i mean i i really appreciate black society you know um and i and as you get older you see that i mean just like there are in in white society i mean you know not all white people are middle class and living in the burbs i mean right. You can just right. watch. My cat is being really annoying, so I just have to let him in. Sorry, I'm gonna. Okay. You are terribly behaved. Okay. Um. So what, there's two things I want to sort of pick apart right there, right? So like, I love that you can admit that you even felt faux woke. I think that's such an interesting phenomena probably happening with some black people right now. Like, whoa, they yeah. didn't even realize your own bias because then you got to a place where you experienced what I would maybe call, um, you know, other people that arguably would make you feel more at home because of their skin color and because it no, was- Don't their skin color that they would make us feel more at home. I mean, it's just like with- That's um, fascinating to me. I don't because know why. usually, do you know why, Monique? I feel like usually as a white person, I, Society, like you know what you learned like if you've ever seen like those movies uh, about Britain and the upper classes and the lower classes in Britain and how you know they're like oh we went through the, the slums of London and on our way out to the country and these people are like animals well right. I mean what make you think anyone else of a different race wouldn't feel the same that's so oh see I'm still so racist this is like proof of it but I'm glad that you just pointed yeah. that out because I just feel like sometimes I feel like I hear black people say, you know, um, not, not have the same experience of like, wow, like people to people, right? Like these people are ill behaved. These people are well behaved. I think I end up hearing like the reason that that happens is because black people are put in certain circumstances in certain situations and I think what I hear you saying, though, was that your experience was like, this is just not good behavior, period. But yes, like, it's also, not. Like, there's no quality educational environment there. 
Right. And, and, but that's, it has nothing to do with race. And sometimes it doesn't even have anything to do with economics because my parents were not, uh, you know, born into middle class. They were right. born in the South. They were, they were older when they had us. I mean, they were married for 15 years without children. They were married 54 and had me and 69 and my sister in 70. Wow. And they taught time why. And they're like, you don't have, can't afford to feed and or educate. That, I mean, the rule in our house was, and they were old school, we don't care if you killed someone or wanted by the Hague, don't come home pregnant. You won't be coming home at all. Yeah. They were old oh. school. My mom told me, because they were born in the 30s, when a woman got preg a girl got pregnant, they would send you away to have the baby. And then once you got married, you go back and claim the baby and become a family again. And she's like, and everyone would know, you know, that you were away. And people, would, would, the moment you went away, no one would want their kids to hang out with their, their siblings or because they were afraid of you taking on their ways. You know, and she told me about a place outside of Selma called the Bottoms, which was where like women that were loose would hang out or people that would drink or, you know, basically uh, going out. The debaucherous. Yeah, like going out for a Friday night drink, you know, maybe like what the village was like in the 70s or the 80s. I mean, that wasn't being loose, but it was at the time, you know, in the conservative deep south, that was like, no, you went home, you, you cooked for your family. You know, you sat and talked with your husband for a bit and maybe, and you went to bed. You didn't hang out, but that was where the pe the bottoms people lived. The bottoms. And they, and this was, and this, and the, you know, it wasn't, these people weren't, I don't know if they were poor, but my parents were definitely raised. I mean, my dad grew up in, in, on a farm and yeah. my mom, Selma, and in the colored part of the town. And you were, you were barely even allowed an education. My grandfather had a small business and my mother, my grandmother, my maternal grandmother worked as a maid. Yeah. Fascinating. Wow. Still, there's morals and ethics. And the one thing I learned studying history, just growing up, was the people that have the, the least amount of ethics that you would think are the, the either the very, very wealthy and, some, and sometimes the very, very, and sometimes the very, very wealthy and sometimes the very, very poor. Yeah. 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 In terms of. I mean, if you look at like, you know, say like what the French aristocracy was. Right. What? Right. And then you look at, you know, I'm sure you could find it, it, the same sort of morals and ethics amongst the very, very poor in France. Uh, some of them. Yeah. You know. Or you, just you, look at our country. Look at the most powerful person in the, in the United States who has zero ethics. He's, 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 I mean, he, you know, just because you're money does, money does not guarantee morals. It right, doesn't. exactly. Well, that's for sure. I mean, yeah. that is like, you know, truth bomb. But something I, I would, one would learn growing up if they paid attention to history. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Um, do you feel like you, knowing what you know now as an adult 51-year-old Black woman, do you feel like you were taught history properly about American history and slavery <laughs> and the indigenous people? <laughs> So always made sure we knew. Who who did your parents? Make sure we knew, and also we asked questions. Like most people think, like black is a social construct, and so is white. There is no such thing as a, the white race. There's a European race, and there's you know the the you know um the African the, Caribbean the, right the Negro race at the time, or the black or 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 the African of African descent. Most people think, you know, I always knew that Egyptians were, or, or the, at least the original ones were um, black because yeah. look at the dot. The, if you, have you ever seen a picture of the original Anwar Sadat? Yes, of course. That's not a white man. And right. I'm talking about on the continent of Africa. Well, I that's why now it's like BIPOC, which I know some DEI experts hate that term, but it, you know, I think, you know, Black, Indigenous, and people of color really does capture it all now with, you know, Black people being in the Caribbean or Black people being in Africa or in Europe or... In, 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 um, outside of recent history, outside, I'd say, of the Jews, we're the largest exodus of a people in human history. Black people are not Indigenous to the Caribbean. Those right. are... I, my parents taught us, and also, you know, I learned even um, in... in 
not, not so much in, well, some in school, but those, those islands were, in, were at first stopovers on the way to North and South America. And then they decided, let's stop over here and, and we can do, we can make, uh, have plantations here. Right. They were all like French or, or English owned in the first place, right? Territory, you, rather. In, in Europe and North America, because, you know, you, people weren't growing co cotton, cocoa, you know, coconuts, wa you know, um, pineapples, bananas. Those were, you know, like fruits you, I mean, you know, you just didn't see in that part of the world. And they were quite, quite rare. Yeah, yeah. Oh and my God. Happen. I feel like I have so much to digest from this conversation. I might even need to like rest. Well, as you know, just having all the same experience. I was, my neighborhood, my neighbors were unique. They were, there were blacks, there were terms on plant, on, and, and during slavery, quadroon was a quarter black, octagoon an eighth, sex to me because one drop made you black. They didn't care if you were one, 180, 2010, you were <laughs> one drop black. Right, and right. That could determine, you know, the position you got in the house. You know, sometimes you have work in the house because the master may not consider you offensive to see. Right. But you'd have to tie up your hair because maybe your hair was considered offensive to, to see. You know, and, and then also that led to, um, you know, biases amongst Blacks, like only marrying, like, quadroons, only marrying quadroons. Or, or if you were good, they didn't mind marrying Black. It was just, like, people like Adam Clayton Powell. His, he, his relatives were ne my next-door neighbors. The rule wow. in the house was for their daughters, Patty and Sarah, if she can't use a comb, you don't bring her home. Oh, <laughs> oh my God, I'm going to stop you because we only have a couple minutes left. Owls looked like you and had hair like you. So they were looking to marry black, but you had to be, you had to be able to pass. Right. Because yeah, I was asking the Mrs. Powell, what are you? And she said, I am what you are. And my mom told me, I, my mom had to explain. And Patty Powell, both of them ended up marrying white. Their kids are about 20 years on us. But, um, oh, Patty had come out to her husband after she married when he out when after he married and she's like he's like we can't stay married you're nothing but a nigger she lost her mind ended up being in an institution and committed suicide oh my uh, god sarah or no that was sarah patty her son is a little 10 years younger than me he my mom said he had he he didn't marry her and they had a kid brooke he put brooke through school but he had her living on communes and 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 everything and she put him through med school he's like after he got his practice established he, he divorced her and got himself a real white woman oh my goodness okay let me ask you um a final question as we get to the end of our time together which is that um <laughs> what do you want so you said to young people, like, surround yourself with different kinds of people and different races and a whole mix, but what else watch. do you want, want them to know about pursuing their dreams at this particular time in America? That nothing is important, and it's really important to do it now. You know, be, always be focused on, I, well, we watched a lot of news when I was growing up, so, and, and, and also because of the school I went to, but you always have to be aware that the world, most Americans think that the world revolves around America. I'm like, no, Rome is coming, gone, Egypt is coming, gone, it, empire, the French Empire, the British Empire, Austro-Hungarian Empire is coming, gone. The world will go on, with or without, uh, it, it'll just, you, Anyone can be replaced. Anything can be replaced. So to know history, you know, and that, you know, and to, and to educate yourself because education is power. Yes. And have a voice, right? What say you about the election, right? Vote. Vote, whatever you do. I mean, the, we've had bigots for presidents. I mean, that's what do you mean we've had. We have. We and have some right now. But that's been the the legacy of the American presidency up until very very recently. I mean, even Nixon was a bigot. Yeah. But, um, you know, and we have one now, and you know, people get very comfortable. Even black people, you know, I've got my laptop, I've got my this, I've got my that. But comfortability, regardless of what race you are, even with the French uh, re Revolution, they learned that can be taken from you. Yeah. Yeah. So get your voice out there, people. And on that note, I want to say from the bottom of my heart, thank you, Monique, for being with me today. Everybody go check out homesweethomepeople.com and buy yourself some Monique originals. 
And um, I wish you every good thing. And I'm so glad that we now know each other. Thank you for being part of the series with me. Well, yes, keep in touch. Even if you, without the series, keep in touch. You got <laughs> it. Thanks, Monique. Bye. Take care.